Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Sanguinius. A hero is someone who has given his or her life to something bigger than oneself. Was there ever another guardian so beloved by the people? My good blade carves the casks of men. My tough lance thrusteth sure. My strength is as the strength of ten. Because my heart is pure. Sanguinius, the great angel, the brightest one, lord of Baal, the master of hosts, also known as Papa Sang, fabulous fucking hawk boy, space Jesus, definitely not Led Zeppelin's Robert Plant, Primarch fabulous to the people of TG Sanguinius, beloved by always, and that was as quite significant, the Primarch of the Blood Angels chapter, formerly Legion, of Space Marines. He was notable for the fuckhook angel-like wings, not to be confused with the actual angel, that mutated out of his back during his childhood on his home planet, Baal, as well as his heroic deeds during the Great Crusade. Unfortunately, Sanguinius was slain by Horus during his eponymous heresy, though it is widely believed that it was Sanguinius' weakening of the arch traitor which made it possible for the Emperor to shut Horus's big, stupid, heresy spewing mouth once and for all, and thus save mankind from the clutches of chaos. And for some reason, the Black Library likes drawing him with silly hair rolls. Though at least his model accurately depicts his fabulous flowing hair, second only to the Emperor himself. Crimea River Fulgrim. Origins. Like the rest of the Primarchs, Sanguinius was bioengineered on Terra to serve as a general in the Emperor's armies, and was stolen in his infancy and carried away across the galaxy by demonic agents of chaos in an attempt to foil the Emperor's efforts to unite humanity. Landing on Baal, he was found by the Folk of the Blood, a local tribe who raised him to manhood. They were going to kill him for being a mutant, but when it became clear that Sanguinius was a baddest warrior prodigy the likes of which they'd never seen, they decided he was worth keeping. After all, Sanguinius was actually a pretty nice guy for 40k, and he was pretty handy at fighting off those other mutants that kept attacking them from Baal's radioactive deserts, which he could walk through without any protection. As such, Sanguinius quickly ascended as a leader among the tribes of Baal and drove back the hordes of mutants threatening their hold on the world, eventually attaining a near godlike status among the planet's denizens. After the Emperor found Baal and bade Sanguinius to assume his rightful place among his armies, Sanguinius wept a single tear of joy because he is manly enough to be in touch with his feelings and bow before the Emperor. Of the canonical space marines, his chapter is to this day one of the most batchet loyal to the Emperor himself. Comma the greatest of Sanguinius tribal warriors were extended the honor of joining the Adeptus Astartes, and were thereafter implanted with the gene C drawn from Sanguinius genome. These men became the first members of the 9th Space Marine Legion to be founded, and the Blood Angels were born, not from terror at least. The Great Crusade. Joining the Great Crusade, Sanguinius became best buds with fellow Primarchs Horus, Robout Gilliman, Magnus the Red, Jagate Khan and Rogel Dawn. Ironically, and later, tragically, his friendship with Horus is said to have been closer than that of any of the other Primarchs. Which, this being Warhammer, went straight to hell when the Horus heresy started. He was easily the most fabulous of all the Emperor's generals, Sukai T. Fulgrim. He wore a glowing, ornate set of golden artificer armor adorned with huge rubies which represented Terra, Baal, and Baal's moons, and his magnificent white wings would spread behind him as he took to the skies of the battlefield. At the same time, he gave the impression that he'd be happy to cast off his finery, whereas Fulgrim would rather die. Basically, in Sanguinius' case, G-Bubs abandoned all pretense of being subtle about the whole the Emperor is God, the Primarchs are the Archangels, and Horus is Lucifer thing, like, to the point that Sanguinius became known simply as the Angel among the armies of mankind. He did some pretty cool shit during the Crusade too. At one point taking on an entire blood mad elder craft world with a third of his legion. Admittedly it was a struggle, the craft world fielded wraiths in large numbers, and had to deploy the auto sinister Psy titans after massive elder wraith machines destroyed his legio furians allies, but still, 
Sanguinis managed to tear the head off one of the walkers. Not a sparkly, feathery man to fuck with. Though not first in favor among the Emperor's Primarchs, the position belonged to Horus, pre-heresy, or the biggest psychic powerhouse, or the best at empire building, or even the one who looked most like Dad. Sanguinius was said to have the best blend of the Big E's attributes, which, considering the fact that Space Marines are a toned-down version of their Primarchs, may imply the Blood Angels are the most similar to the Emperor. While a lot of the Space Marine Legions and their generals fought in the Great Crusade just for the sake of glory and a good battle, Sanguinius and his Blood Angels fought for what the Emperor himself did, a better galaxy, a peaceful galaxy, one where humanity would be united, happy, and prosperous. During the Crusade, the Blood Angels formed a friendly rivalry with the World Eaters Legion, yet another relationship the Horus Heresy would royally buttfuck because both were noted for being assault-oriented shock troops. However, while they were pretty evenly matched in their level of prowess, saddled with the Butcher's Nails, the World Eaters were straight-up lunatics in combat, whereas the Blood Angel's ferocity was channeled and refined when it needed to be by sanguineous wisdom. Also, everyone loved the guy. Even at the depths of his heresy, even Horus wished Sanguinius was one of his generals. And he was a good guy who doesn't afraid of anything. Cygnus Prime and Cabandha. At one point during the Great Crusade, Sanguinius and the Blood Angels were tasked by Warmaster Horus with reclaiming the Cygnus Cluster from a supposed Xenos infestation and liberating the humans there from their oppressors. However, when they arrived, they found that the entire system had been consumed by the evil influence of the Chaos Gods, and specifically a Keeper of Secrets calling itself Curious the Perverse. This was actually a trap set by Horus in an attempt to eliminate Sanguinius early on, because he feared him more than any of his other fellow Primarchs as he was nearly as equal in both combat and commanding. Also this was after Horus's corruption and Sanguinius was not aware of the Eistvan conflicts at the time. Long story short, the Blood Angels were stranded in system, caught off guard, and lost a lot of marines, ships, and crew but eventually regrouped and conquered the armies of cultists and chaos demons in the Cygnus system. Kyrus even manifested on the bridge of the Red Tear, the Blood Angel's flagship, from the frames of eight servitors, to taunt Sanguinius. This was also Horus's first true defeat, as there was no benefit gained from the campaign. But a greater threat soon emerged, Kabandha, a powerful bloodthirster and one of Korn's greatest servants. He attacked the Blood Angels while taunting Sanguinius in the middle of the battle and claimed that Horus had betrayed him. Refusing to believe this, Sanguinius attacked in rage, and managed to stab his sword right into the demon's chest and wound him severely. Kabanha, almost beaten, distracted the Primarch with the truth of Horus's betrayal. Kabanha then lashed out with his whip, ensnaring Sanguinius' legs and crushing them. Then, leaving Sanguinius alive for some reason. Perhaps fearful Sanguinius really would become an angel if he died, then charge off to slay a few hundred blood angels. The Red Thirst, already a problem for the blood angels, was exacerbated by the psychic shockwaves of each of his sons dying, and Sanguinius vowed that he would take vengeance on Kabanta for this atrocity. In the Chaos Temple at the center of the battle, Sanguinius dueled Kabanta again ripping off a wing and then throwing him off a platform and back through a portal into the realm of chaos. To top it off, Sanguinius then faced Kyrus and beheaded that sick fuck, promptly ending his rule and chaos hold on the system. In a moment of hesitation, Sanguinius was tempted by the offer of becoming a chaos champion in exchange for curing the red thirst and black rage. Seeing this, Meris jumped straight into the portal, telling his Primarch not to give up hope. Turning into the demon known as the Red Angel, Meris Genesis would later be transplanted onto Arcus. Inspired by his sacrifice Sanguinius was able to say no to the demons. This gave him the courage to resist the temptation of chaos later on when Made offered the same deal. During the later Horus heresy, Blade with whom I have lived, Blade with whom I now die. Serve right and justice one last time, seek one last heart of evil. Still one last life of pain. Cut well, old friend, and then farewell. Sir Aurin Neville Smythe. After Cygnus Prime, the majority of the Blood Angels found themselves on the wrong side of the Rune Storm.
drawn to Macra by the Pharos. Sanguinius learned that his brothers Gilliman and the Lion were trying to set the beginnings of a second imperium. Sanguinius reluctantly accepted the premise, and was instated as the emperor of the Imperium Secundus. Being emperor didn't sit easily with him, and much of the day-to-day -day ruling was done by Gilliman and the Lion. After Kurz paid him a nasty visit screen competition, the angel demanded more oversight into the affairs of the new emperor. When Kurz was finally captured, all three members of the Imperial Triumvirate realized that Terra had not yet fallen, but that Sanguinus would be doomed to die by Horus's hand. The angel had in truth already foreseen his death at the hands of Horus, and knew what it would mean for his sons. However, he accepted that his sacrifice was necessary to preserve his father's works in the long run and took solace in the fact that the blood angels would continue to follow in his footsteps even as they grappled with the black rage. Moreover, via the temptations of chaos he endured with his brothers and the road storm, he found that the false hope he had been given, namely that he could survive the end of the Horus heresy and even triumph, but learned it would come with a terrible cost. He would gain power from chaos and slay Horus and save his sons from the curse to come. As a greater demon of chaos undivided made mention that Horus had become an imperfect vessel and that Papa Sang was to take his place as the angel of ruin. So in a nutshell it's the last temptation of Sanguinius, but with less will and daffo. Naturally space vampire Jesus didn't take the demon up on the author and fought his way through a demon throng until he pinned the demon halfway through the materium and the warp. In his mind a last defiant act, choosing to neither be slain by Horus or choose chaos, but to die holding the demon in between the rift to the warp so his brother Primarx could orbitally bombard Davin into dust. Unfortunately through vision he realized that the black rage would be inevitable, as the proto-rage had filled him by that point, its origins being explained as the violent hatred and rage at the betrayal of Horus against him and the Emperor, and the sheer pain of his death, existing in the past and future as it resonated through time, and the grief of the death he hadn't experienced yet. Timmy wimmy bullshit shenanigans aside, if the Jesus metaphors weren't strong enough, Sanguinius Herald stepped up to the plate and planted his sword in the demon's spine and held it there so Sanguinius wouldn't have to die there. And with that last act the flickers of hope that had died in Sanguinius rekindled and witnessed the miracle of a new angel coming into being. The Herald was empowered by the war, glowing a radiant gold with the outline of wings springing from his shoulders as he became in the Primarch's own words the son of my hope. Explaining the origins of one of the blood angels speechless of snowflakes, making him a Drago Celestin-esque demon prince of Sanguinius. That sound you're hearing is the noise of every Puritan Inquisitor's blood vessels bursting in their eyes. On the positive, because of the triumvirate of Primarch's success on Davin the runestorm abated revealing a straight shot to terror. On a negative, Horus had left a massive fleet to protect the way there. How he knew that that place would be the way that opened for them is a bit of a mystery, and all tactical scenarios concluded that if they tried to engage them simultaneously they would only be mired down so that none of them could reach terror. So the Primarchs decided to split up, taking a page out of the codex of brother Vincentius Lombardius, they would split the defense and rush the goal. Gilliman using the sheer bulk of his larger fleet to engage the traitors while the lion fell back and attacked the traitor legion's homeworlds, burning them with extreme prejudice, while the blood angels hung back long enough for Gilliman to break the bulk of the armada and the lion to draw away and contend with the forces that splintered away as he burned their homes, giving us a nice tidy bow of exactly where the hell the other primarchs were when shit happened. As Sanguinius corroborated his visions with Kurz, he felt that he had come across a revelation, hence the need for his legion to be the ones to reach terror. He may have been fated to perish at the hands of Horus, but even if destiny was set, the consequence could be altered. He would fight and die, but his sacrifice would allow the Imperium to persist. He let Kurz in on this, letting him in on the razor-thin hope of the future's mutability. He said he could take the Night Haunter to the Emperor, and that the Big E could do something Conrad had never thought of exploring. He could forgive him. Just as a spark of hope entered his eyes, Sanguinius promised that he wouldn't allow that for Kurz, that he would freeze Kurz in stasis and jettison the pod, preserving him for millennia if necessary, and that Conrad Kurz had no fucking chance of outrunning or changing his future death terrifying 40k Batman so hard he'd probably be locked in an eternity of despair as he's frozen in stasis. Good is not nice, 
Indeed. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. With the help of the Dark Angels and the Ultra Greens, the Blood Angels were able to make it back to Terra in the closing days of the Horus Heresy to defend it from the traitor legions and their demonic allies. Sanguinius and his legion led the defense of the Imperial Palace itself when the forces of chaos closed in around it, and the Primarch slew innumerable demons, traitors and other resorted scum in the process. Fortunately for Sanguinius, Kabandha also turned up during the battle, and the two went at it again rather majestically atop the Eternity Gate to the Emperor's throne room. Not to be beaten again, Sanguinius managed to snap Kabandha's spine over his Mathurfaking knee and hurled the bastard's corpse back into the throng of chaos filth below, and the blood angels who had died by the bloodthirster's hand were thus avenged in the most spectacularly badass of ways. But this is Warhammer 40,000 and Noblebrite doesn't last very long against Grimdark, even when it's bad as Noblebrite. Eventually, the Big E himself, along with Sanguinius, Rogaldorn, Rogaldorn's mustache, and a contingent of their respective marines, launched a last-ditch assault against Horus, teleporting aboard his battle barge and taking the fight to the Warmaster himself. As fighting broke out across the capital ship, Sanguinius got sequestered from the rest of the assault party, and when he found Horus, he was alone. Horus, perhaps out of some small, lingering sense of brotherhood with Sanguinius, offered his former friend, for the final time, a chance to turn to chaos. The Sanguinius said never, and the two Primarchs proceeded to battle for the fate of mankind. Though Sanguinius was one of the most powerful of the Primarchs, he was wounded and wearied from the fight on Terra and already at a disadvantage, and Horus had been granted terrible power by the gods of chaos to boot. Terrible indeed, because he apparently wasn't as good at warp poker as the Emperor and Batchet insane by then. He even called one of his sons Melast at some point as recently revealed in Saturnine. Horus therefore slew Sanguinius so hard that it psychically traumatized the Blood Angels for ages to come, and the Black Rage became the, almost, inescapable mental scourge it is on the chapter today. After death, Iskander Cairn revealed an interesting fact about the vengeful spirit, after letting himself be captured. Apparently, those who died aboard it had echoes of themselves bound to the ship, manifesting as crystal statues that let you experience a part of their deaths if you touched them. Sanguinius's statue is the most talked about in both Black Legion books. It seems to move around and regenerate somehow when no one notices. Cairn uses shards of Sanguinius's crystalline ghost along with shards of his sword to create Cairn's excellent force sword, which is probably equal to a master crafted one if not even better. Doing this with a piece of Sanguinius's couldn't possibly end badly for a chaos sorcerer. Interestingly this might mean Sanguinius could eventually be resurrected should the statue be captured. No statue of Horus exists on the vengeful spirit, so this might be the ghost of the angel, trapped forever in his final moments. The fact that the Black Rage traps his sons in the exact same state may imply that the rage is not the backlash of Sanguinius's death, but rather the echoes of his current statuesque existence. Of course that would require actual plot, so it probably won't happen. It could ruin Jellyman's date night. This is also Kayan we're talking about, so it's also likely he's full of shit, as this phenomenon would have flooded every possible inch on the ship with crystallized corpses given how short the lifespans are for the slaves working on it. Because dying of natural causes in the warp must happen all the time. Discounting possible Nurgle entropy related stuff. Close bracket. During the devastation of Bayer, after being introed by the Sanguiner, the spirit of Sanguinius appeared before Dante when the latter was in a near-death state after killing the Swarm Lord and proudly declared Dante his greatest son. 
After Dante expresses a desire to join his Primarch in death, Sanguinius sadly informs his long-suffering son that his duty has not yet ended, and uses his warp powers to heal and reinvigorate Dante, before he is painfully yanked back into the world of the living. Subsequently, in the time not long after Dante's appointment as regent of Imperium Nihilus by Gilliman, Mephiston underwent the Rubicon Primaris, turning him into a Primaris Marine. During the procedure, he too was visited by Sanguinius in the spirit realm, which brought Mephiston to tears. Yes, you read that correctly, Mephiston, the lord of death himself, self, literally, not figuratively, fell to his knees and began to weep when greeted by Sanguinius, and immediately addressed him as my father. Just let that sink in. Interestingly, during his convalescence, in a conversation with Dante, Mephiston was able to recognize that Dante too had been visited by and conversed with their father. Though Mephiston expressed some uncertainty as to whether or not it had actually been Sanguinius whom they had spoken with, not wishing to be disappointed, Dante on the other hand knew better and was adamant. Legacy. Although Sanguinius lost to Horus, it is widely believed that the Emperor would not have been able to destroy Horus afterwards were it not for the chink that Sanguinius puts in Horus armor. Second, it is also widely agreed that if Horus hadn't come to save his legions as that day on Terra, it would have been ground out of existence by Sanguinius and the Blood Angels. Lastly, it is also agreed that Sanguinius was tired after several days of fighting. He defied the likes of Cabanda and fucking demon Primarch Angren on the battlements. Comma is already bleeding and wounded, as shown by Rome Storm. And if he had been totally refreshed, Horus would have had a lot more than just a chink in his armor. However, in the Horus Heresy Collected Visions, it details the battle between the Emperor and Horus, and makes it clear that the main reason Big E didn't kill him immediately is because he thought he might be able to save him. A sentiment that seems to be inching further and further to the fore is the Siege of Terror series progresses, incidentally. Though it was a hope which was dashed as soon as the Emperor saw Sanguinius' body. However, in Visions of Heresy, Big E still held back, even after seeing Sanguinius' body. It wasn't until the Emperor was mortally wounded on the floor that this changed. It says that as he's lay, waiting for the final blow, a certain adamantium bald Imperial Guardsman, exemplifying everything it means to be one, appears and rushes toward him. Horus contemptuously kills the Guardsman without barely an effort, laughing maniacally as he did so. It was this utter contempt for taking a life which finally made the Emperor realize there was no saving his son. In short, if Horus is Lucifer and the Emperor is God, then Sanguinius is Jesus. Sanguinius died for your sins, just like Optimus Prime does on a daily basis. Sanguinius also bears the rare distinction of being one of the few Primarchs, alongside Horus, Pharos Manus, Lemon Russ, Pertrarabo, and Rob Out Gilliman, who were capable of lasting more than 3 seconds against Angra, who had Sanguinius' strength, but was much quicker to go all out. Furthermore, though we won't know for sure until the conclusion of the Siege of Terror novels, Consistently the consensus and the fluff seems to be that especially following Angron's ascension to a demon prince of Korn, only Horus or Sanguinius would be able to surpass and kill Angron, though the Lion and Lemon Russ would also probably give him a run for his money. It should also be noted that, unlike his brothers, who each embodied one of the Emperor's traits, Rob out Gilliman was his strategy, Angron was his ferocity, etc. Comma Sanguinius was the embodiment of the Emperor as a whole. So. You could argue that the Blood Angels are the Astartes closest to the Emperor, suck it, Ward. In the 41st millennium, Sanguinius is the Primarch most beloved by the Imperium for his heroic sacrifice, despite what he who shall not be named would say about our spiritual leech, and is a hero of the Imperial cult. Across the Imperium a celebration called the Sanguinola is held in his honor, where adepts wear the iconography of the Blood Angels. A festival dedicated to Lemon Russ would have been a better party, but would also have involved more property damage and alcohol-related deaths. Also, apparently, Reclusiard Grimaldus is not a huge fan of it. The mysterious entity known as the Sanguinar is believed to be the incarnation of Sanguinius' better nature, or the first sanguinary guard herald as Keelan, miraculously preserved through time. Its actual origin, though, is far more mundane. When Sanguinius was named Emperor of Gilliman's Imperium Secundus, 
He and those Keelan invented the figure by sealing one of the sanguinary guard into his own armor, erasing his identity and allowing him to act as Sanguinius public face and deal with petitioners, whilst Sanguinius himself could be elsewhere, you know. Dealing with stuff. By the end of the Horus Heresy, Sanguinius Herald went through some kind of apotheosis on Davin while taking his Primarch's place in the opening of a warp portal, and as Keelan would be the only member of the Sanguinary Guard to actually survive the Horus Heresy, so most people think the current incarnation is him. In modern 40k, outside of perhaps the Sanguinary Guard themselves, the only living people who know the truth of the Sanguinar's origin is the Lion, but he's in no position to tell anyone and rob out Gilman, who cannot provide the origin of the Sanguinar without having to explain why the Emperor needed a proxy. Since nobody else in the 42nd millennium is entirely certain of the truth, it's getting the Inquisition's panties in a bunch. But whether or not the modern and original Sanguinar are the same person, something warpy had to happen since then, since the Sanguinar pops in and out of the Immaterium, Legion of the Damned style. It is a well-known fact that every female, human, Xenos, and Demonet, in the Behold Grim Dot Galaxy wants Sanguinius sexually, as well as most males, including Corn WHO the fuck said that. And Slanesh, Benny Sororitas, and Summer Starts, cry themselves to sleep at the knowledge that they won't ever be able to hold his beautiful golden mane as he slays their quivering love pudding with his mighty, throbbing, enormous power sword. A recent flub on Twitch TV has revealed that Sanguinius may actually not be dead after all, but rather in stasis. God damn it GW. Actually they meant to say his model would be released for Horus Heresy along with the rest of the Primarchs who still don't have models. Take note, this article contains a considerably smaller amount of the usual humor found on this wiki. That's just how revered Sanguinius is. People don't like joking about him. As is the nature of the shifting turbulent cluster fuckery that is Warhammer 40k lore. In a strange turn of events, Primarch Sanguinius is also the only Primarch human being that has guarded the respect of Zarek, the silent king of the Necrons. That's right, the king of a 60 million year old race of space zombie robot Egyptians that hates all life and views all other civilizations as inferior beings to be completely wiped out and almost harvested the entire galaxy seems to regard Sanguinius in significant esteem. When he met with Dante, he was wearing a freaking gold Sanguinius mask out of respect for the great angel. In fact, one of Zarek's own heralds says to Dante of Sanguinius that if there was ever a human to be mourned, noble Zarek would say it was him. Holy crap. The single oldest material being in the entire setting outside of the sea town seems actually to regret Sanguinius being dead. Revered indeed. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.